Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. You all will be happy to hear that I thought this was a 20-minute talk, not a 30-minute talk. And I promise not to make each point one and a half times. And so I'm going to talk about the clinical use of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, let's see. So the concept of T-cell adoptive therapy is pretty simple. The T-cells are the predominant mediators of tissue rejection. And in the initiation of this, we've used vaccines to try and generate the T-cells. We've used cytokines to expand them both in vitro and in vivo. And then finally, you've heard of how we've tried to remove the inhibitory checkpoints to allow their function to continue unimpeded. And so I think this is a paradigm for all the components that need to be combined ultimately in order to get the best tumor rejection situation. And so transferring tumor reactive T cells that have been expanded in vitro is a direct way to achieve some of these goals. It permits the use of reagents that human beings will not be able to tolerate in many cases. You can use in vitro things you can't use in vivo. And you can also independently manipulate the recipient apart from their T cell repertoire components so as to uh, optimize the environment into which the T cells are then put. And so it allows you a lot of freedom where you don't have to impair the T cell agonist arm while you're preparing the recipient. Now, the model for this for us has been tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from melanoma. It's been long known that human melanomas very frequently contain cells that have the immunological capability to recognize the autochthonous tumor. And when um, uh, Stephanie Goff in the surgery branch looked at this with the crude techniques we had available, about two-thirds of all human melanomas could be demonstrated in the laboratory to have specific recognition of the autologous tumor from which they're derived. And we could also show that you could expand these extensively thousands, even hundreds of thousands of fold. This was Suzanne's initial project in the surgery branch, and she developed the techniques to do this, and, um, and we could expand them. Unfortunately, as Nick showed, we're also pushing them closer and closer toward the uh, river of death, and that's one of the prices we have yet to uh, uh, avoid paying. This is what it looks like when you take a fresh melanoma that's been enzymatically digested, shown over here with melanoma cells and small resting lymphocytes, put them in IL-2, you see fibroblasts competing some dead tumor cells, the, the start of some growing lymphocytes, but two weeks after that, you see this is all lymphocytes. This is a big ball of lymphocytes. Tumor cells are destroyed, all of the competing cells are gone, and this can then expand for weeks, even months later uh, at a high rate, and this can result in populations of cells, very large populations of cells that can be given adoptively. We now do this with fragments. We just chop them up into small pieces. We put them directly into IL-2, and crawling out of these fragments of one or two millimeters each will be lymphocytes. And we set them up in multiple wells, and we grow them independently and assay their activity and select ones that we think have favorable activity. This is the other factor in the clinical treatment as we now give it, the independent manipulation of the recipient. And Nick, uh, Nick's lab has done extensive work showing why this helps, why immunosuppression of the recipient prior to the T cell administration is beneficial, and there are many factors. But this is the clinical schema we use. We give cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. That drops your white count and your lymphocyte count to zero. We infuse the T cells at the time when there is no endogenous lymphoid compartment. Uh, we give as much IL-2 as the patient can tolerate, usually just for a day or two. It's very, it's high dose, but it's given with a lot of restraint. Um, and then we allow them to spontaneously recover from this non-myeloablative combination. And this, we think, facilitates the engraftment of the recipient with mature T cells, something hard to accomplish. We've given up to 10 to the 12th mature T cells to a patient over two days who was immunologically replete, and within days you cannot find what you gave. It's like filling a glass that's already full. And so if you immunodeplete these patients, you can find these cells circulating in the blood at one, two, 10, even higher percentages, even years after you've given them. So the lymphodepletion, we think, facilitates the engraftment. And we saw very dramatic responses. These are some of our more recent responses, but bulky liver disease in patients rapidly progressing will rapidly regress. This is an incomplete response. To get a complete response can take up to one or two years after a single administration of T cells. And, and so we, we're, we're patient, and uh, this is only September. This is another patient that shows it can be very durable. This is a patient we show many times, but since he has 10-year follow-up, it's a little more convincing that this is a durable and complete modality for some patients. 
This is another patient who had adrenal disease, multiple lung lesions, again, treated six years ago, seven years ago. And these, all these patients receive a single adoptive T-cell transfer. They can show rapid recalcification and remodeling of bony lytic metastases all through the sacrum and the, uh, and the pelvis. You can see in two months that started to recover. And you can also see the regression and even the durable regression of small asymptomatic brain metastases. We don't treat large ones because of the potential need for steroids and for bleeding, but when a patient shows up and on the day of treatment has new brain metastases that are asymptomatic and don't require steroids, we have treated them. We've seen up to a 44% response rate, objective response rate, within the CNS in these patients. And so we don't think the CNS is an absolute sanctuary site. And so this is a a, a series that we show frequently, because again, it every patient in this series now has seven-year follow-up. And so these are 93 patients. They were treated with a variety of preparative regimens, from the cyclophosphamide fludarabine non-myeloablator regimen shown here, to low-dose total body irradiation and high-dose total body irradiation. These two patients do get autologous, these two groups do get autologous CD34s to ensure their recovery. Uh, this group may not need it, but this certainly does. And there are 43 patients initially, and then two groups of 25 treated consecutively. And what you see is the initial response rate to the simple regimen was 49%. It was then 52%, not much different with low-dose TBI, and then 72% in the group that got high-dose TBI. These are not statistically significantly different, but what was interesting was this group had a 40% complete response rate, and of the 10 complete responders in this group, only one has ever relapsed. And so nine out of 25 patients here treated with a single administration of T cells all over seven years ago are maintaining ongoing complete responses. And in fact, every complete response achieved in this entire series is durable with this one exception. So this is when you achieve a complete response, even if it takes a year or two, these are almost always durable. These are the overall survival curves. Uh, it turns out that the TBI groups are not statistically significantly different than the simple cyclophosphamide fludarabine group. Uh, so we, if you put them all together, this is the experience for the 93 patients. And you can see there's a plateau here of about 30% long-term survival, and almost every tick on this part of the curve is a, an ongoing complete responder. And so these patients, you know, who are they? They are 85% patients with visceral metastases, um, only 15% with M1A disease, and 80% of them have had high-dose IL-2 in the past and, and not responded. As you see, nearly all complete responding patients appear to be cured. We always hedge on the use of the word cure. Single administration seven years later, I'm going to use the word. And you can see here that prior therapies have no impact on whether this works or not. These are patients who had prior IL-2, prior chemotherapy, prior interferon, and these are ones who had prior ipilimumab. This is a little deceptive. It looks a little better. It's not statistically significantly better. And just due to timing of when this drug became available, most of these patients were in the cohort who got the 1,200 TBI. We're doing a randomized trial right now of the total body irradiation uh, or not in patients who get cytoxan fludarabine and T-cell transfers, and that's almost done. We'll know that answer within a year or so. But uh, you can see, certainly, the, the, the failure to respond to previous ipilim ipilimumab is, is not a negative prognostic factor. And the other question is then, what about PD-1? You know, when you look at the paradigm for how you drive the melanoma rejection machine, it's like when you get in a car. You, you may have the brakes on. It may be one brake for some people who can respond to PD-1 all by itself. It may be two brakes. You have to remove all the brakes. And that, some of the combination therapies with the checkpoint inhibitors, I think, are telling us that. You, you see more people respond when you remove the brakes. But in our eyes, sometimes you remove the brakes, you fire it up, and you find out you're driving a Yugo. And so you got to have an agonist arm to this process as well. If you've got the Ferrari, the engines are rolling, you, you may need only a little gas. And those are the patients who respond to IL-2. They don't have the brakes on. They've got a great car. They need a little gas. Other people need the engine. And the TIL therapy, I think, provides the engine. I think it provides it more effectively than vaccines do. And so why do people respond to TIL at all? if we don't give them checkpoint inhibitors. Well, it turns out we have inadvertently addressed some of those issues. When you give the host lymphodepletion, you eliminate T regulatory cells in the endogenous environment. When you culture cells long-term in IL-2, they all express PD-1 initially. The tumor reactive component are very high in PD-1. 
but as you culture them, the PD-1 falls dramatically in most patients. And so the expression of the receptor seems to go away with the culture. And so we've inadvertently addressed some of them. Those inhibitory factors may re-express in vivo, and there may be a benefit to combining it with checkpoint inhibitors, but I think the reason we get this high response rate is some of those have been accidentally addre addressed. So the question now is, what about people who have failed this modality as well? And we know very little about that, but in the first six patients who had prior PD-1 and not responded, three of them have responded to TIL. And so I think there is an engine and brake issue here for some of these patients, and removing the brakes on a car that's not running won't work either. And so I think that TIL being complicated and not accessible to everyone everywhere may have its best role as somewhat of a salvage approach or in combination with some of these others as an upfront treatment. And I, I think that may be where it's evolving. But it's a highly effective therapy all by itself. So we wanted to look at what is the value of the tumor assay, because that's a cumbersome thing not accessible to everyone. And because most melanomas already recognize tumor, and probably more than we can actually demonstrate. And the assay for recognition is imperfect. If you don't have autologous tumor or it's not healthy, you'll get a, neg a false negative readout of your assay. So we thought, why not just grow them and give them? Hope for the best and, and think it's better than what you can show. And so we did that in a process called Young Till, where we just grew a bulk uh, population again. We grew them extremely rapidly and we gave them as quickly as we could. We hoped they would have a younger phenotype. As it turns out, they really don't. They look the same as selected and uh, Till grown for a longer period of time. But we did treat 69 patients with these Young Till. And we randomized them to CD8 enrichment or not. That turned out to be not significantly different. So CD4, the role of CD4s in this process is a little unclear. Uh, but if you combine then all 69 patients and look at their overall response rate, it was only 28%. And so that tells us, at least in a non-randomized consecutive way, that the assay is still important. And if you look at the assay results, this is interferon release of TILs in the infusion bag from objective responders versus non-responders. This is a log scale showing the amount of interferon release. That, uh, but only two-thirds of the patients had the autologous tumor, which is the stimulator for this assay that you can see that patients who didn't secrete this minimum amount of interferon, which is about 200 micrograms per milliliter in 24 hours, really there were no responders uh, in, the, uh, in the group uh, that couldn't secrete at least that. But of course, there are good secretors that didn't respond, and maybe those are the, the you know, racing Ferraris with the brakes on. Uh, whether this group will be salvaged with checkpoint inhibitors, I think, is a very important question. But it does tell us, with a significant difference, that the assay may be important. And if you look at this preliminary set from a, our newest protocol, looking at whether this can be validated, uh, again, it seems to be true in that autoreactive uh, cells that can be blocked with anti-class 1 antibody, if you have that, you have 24 out of 34 patients responding. If you cannot demonstrate that, you have 3 out of 15 patients responding. And just, can I go back here? Yes. And just to also point out that if you look for recognition of HLA-matched allogeneic tumors as the alternate target, where they're recognizing a non-mutated shared antigen, there was no significant difference between responders and non-responders. So it really looks like the autologous recognition is the driver of this result. So if you look at selected and unselected for tumor rec autologous tumor recognition, we did the subsequent trial, and, uh, and patients with, uh, in this trial, with, uh, where now patients in one of the arms of a randomized trial, the non-TBI arm, every patient gets their TIL, whether or not they're reactive or not. But we do the assay, and we use it to select individual fragment cultures that appear to have reactivity. And if we do this intervention again, now the preliminary response rate in the first 44 patients in that arm is again 48%. And so in non-randomized back and forth on and off sort of uh, analyses of this, I think the assay and selection is looking like it has benefit. So how do you assay? Well, there are many ways. You can use cytotoxicity. We use cytokine release. You can look at 4-1-BB upregulation. And the TIL have, uh, with no demonstrable tumor recognition, rarely cause any regression. And the sequential non-randomized trial, it does appear that the assay and specificity are, are contributing. So then you have to ask, well, what are the assays that generate this autologous tumor recognition? And we've talked about melanocyte differentiation antigens, tumor testis family antigens, some overexpressed proteins, and then the few examples found by expression cloning of 
tumor-specific mutations that might be targets because they're foreign neoantigens. And so the question is, which of these are the drivers? And so there are a couple of ways you can ask and answer this indirectly. So the first category here was the one most abundant and found first and most exploited up to this point. If you look at Tan Schumacher's analysis of TIL that came from NIH or, or from uh, Mikhail Besser at the Ella Institute, these are the melanocyte differentiation antigens, cancer testis antigens, and overexpressed antigens. And these in a series of TIL from our group and a series of TIL from Mikhail's group, you can see in this sort of heat map where orange is the hottest, is that there is a scattering. Most patients have MART activity, and uh, so that's very common. Um, and some of them have a lot, and some of them have very low levels, and there's a scattering. It's a really a hodgepodge of, of recognition of unmutated antigens. If you look at the selected ones, so these are just how they grow without selection. If you go to the selection process and do it, it's really not different if you're measuring unmutated antigens. In other words, you see the same thing. Lots of MART reactivity, some higher, some lower, um, GP100 epitopes. But these are the known non-mutated, these happen to be all HLA2 restricted as well, but they are the non-mutated antigens. And the, if you believe there's a difference between selected and unselected, it does, it's not reflected in these types of assays. There's also some interesting clinical observations. In those 93 patients given TIL, follow long term, we had 52 objective responders, and 20 of these responses were ongoing beyond five years. There's a partial responder who's at 84 months now, so pretty good as well. And so if you look at these patients and they have long-term follow-up, only one of the 93 developed symptoms of melanocyte differentiation antigen-mediated autoimmunity. And that would be uveitis and auditory symptoms because the stream vascularis of the inner ear contains melanocytes as well. And so it doesn't look like that's the driver of the long-term responders in this group. And to further look at that, we actually have, by TCR, uh, engineered peripheral blood, we've looked at cells that attack the melanocyte differentiation antigens. We had two protocols targeting MART1 and GP100 with TCR transduced PBL. They're given exactly as we give TIL with cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, and the response rates were somewhat lower, 30% and 19%. So that right away tells you you may not be able to achieve the same thing with TIL that you can with targeting the MDAs. But among these 36 patients, 81% had major rash with melanocyte destruction, 42% developed uveitis, and 42% had decreased hearing or vestibulitis. And so that is a very, it's not a subtle finding. This is what skin rash can look like. And so you won't miss this unless you're really not going on rounds. And so we did not see this in, in the TIL experience of 93 patients. And so it's a very different profile if the mediators of the rejection in those 93 patients had been melanocyte differentiation antigens. So I don't think those are it. And so what other defined antigens might be contributing? Well, one class is the cancer testis antigens. And here our parallel experience actually advocates that that could be able to achieve similar results. We treated 22 patients with metastatic melanoma with PBL engineered with a high avidity receptor against NYESO again, with the same conditioning and high-dose IL-2 support, and their overall response rate was 50%, fairly impressive, and we've had four CRs, three of which are ongoing and durable. And we did not see any off-tumor toxicities. And so this is at least one example where we were able to achieve similar results as with the TIL population. So this is a possibility that tumor test of antigens are a cogent contributor to what we see with TIL. But ultimately, the question has to be, because autologous tumor was really the um, recognition parameter that correlated with response best, what about mutated neoantigens? These are just examples of what we see. Again, impressive, large visceral responses. You can see in adrenal sites, a pericaval lymph node. And so this is not dissimilar from TIL, and I couldn't tell you that this is evidence that a tumor testis antigen-driven response was not contributing. But then you want to look at the last one, which is this, proteins containing tumor-specific mutations, because those are the ultimate tumor-specific target with no collateral damage, potentially, on normal tissues. And so this is similar to what uh, Suzanne showed. These are four different methods for sequencing the number of tumor-associated mutations in melanomas, and these are other cancers. And you can see melanoma far and away, probably due to the thymine dimer uh, UV-induced uh, um, mechanism, 
are the highest as a group for tumor mutations. The two other groups that are striking is smokers who develop lung cancer and Lynch syndrome patients who have very high rates of mutation as well. And so if you look at this, this may explain why melanoma is so immunogenic. And so to develop that concept, we wanted to look at are there till that, how often, and are there till that recognize mutated epitopes? And so we did the following. This is mostly work from Paul Robbins, which you grow a till, you identify at least one dominant MHC restriction factor, okay? Then you do whole exome sequencing of the autochthonous tumor to find out what are the tumor-specific mutations. When you find single point non-synonymous mutations, we're ignoring indels, et cetera, but if you look at single non-synonymous point mutations, and you look at every nimer or tenmer that might include that mutation, that's 19 possible candidate peptides for every point mutation, and then you make those lists, and in some of those cases, it's 20,000 peptides on that list. The median is probably around nine to 10,000 10 or nimers around each point mutation that could be a T-cell epitope. And then you just take all 10,000 and rank them according to the HLA prediction algorithm you get 10,000. Now, Tan Schumacher's done this for one patient, too, and he made all 1,600 of them. We don't do that because of the sequestration. So what we do instead is we make 40. We make 25 or 40 of the best ones. And then we take those peptides, and we just pulse them onto a T2 target, and we see, do the TIL recognize it? And they do. And they have in every patient we've looked at so far. There's been about five now. And so here's an example where these are the top 25 it predicted HLA binding peptides from this patient's tumor, and you can see their uh, predicted affinity shown here in uh, millimoles, and so if you look at the, um, uh, I'm sorry, nanomoles, and if you look at the, the variety of genes, there's a whole hodgepodge, but here's one, kind of two, and three, and kind of four that released interferon in response to that mutated peptide being pulsed onto it. And there's another thousands of other candidates down this list, but we only looked at the first 25. Another patient Different patient, first 25, you got a hit on the second most of avid binder to HLA-A2 predicted by an algorithm, and number 16 and number 22. These were all recognized, and it turns out we already knew some of these from expression cloning. We rediscovered them, but we also discovered two more that we did not find with expression cloning. Okay, so this to me is it's not sufficient, it's not evidence that this is the driver, but it is evidence that these can be the drivers, and they help explain why autologous tumor recognition seems to be the best correlate of a better response rate when you do that assay. And I think we're all coming to the same conclusion, and it's, it's a happy conclusion in some ways because these are the ultimate tumor-specific targets. It's an unhappy one in that they're very diverse and they're very complicated. But so we need methods by which we will be able to potentially to address this or at least enhance the population of T cells that are recognizing mutated neoantigens and tumor. And so this is the last thing I'm going to show here, which is work from Elena Gross that looks at some of these inhibitory markers and how they might be used. And, you know, uh, it, it's absolutely correct that the inhibitory markers are not exhaustion markers, they're not, you know, in, you know, end stage markers, they're a sign of T cell engagement. They're a T cell activation marker. And so if you look in a tumor where you see this, you know, Dr. Taub has talked about the standoff of between, you know, these uh, PDL1 expressing tumors and these PD1 expressing T cells and gamma interferons driving this and PD1s being upregulated, this is evidence of engagement. This is the lions and the, you know, Cape buffaloes facing off. But if they didn't see each other, they walk past each other like nothing happens, you will not see that standoff. And that's a bad sign. That's a sign that nothing's going on there. So we wanted to look at, in a tumor, in a melanoma, what about these various markers that can be either turned on or stimulated, they can impede it, they can actually in some cases stimulate the interaction, but mostly they're down-regulatory uh, receptors so that every time we see a viral antigen or something, we just don't turn into a giant lymph node, because we would. We would just turn into a, you know, 10 to the 15th lymphocytes. And so if you look at these markers in fresh melanoma till, these are, this is, um, an assay where you're looking at the uh, a T cell function by interferon release or the transient expression of 4,1-BB in response to tumor. And if you look at this and you look at cells that have been sorted out of a fresh melanoma digest to express PD-1 or not, LAG-3 or not, TIM-3 or not, 4,1-BB or not, 
what you see is the cells that are expressing these markers in the fresh melanoma tumor contain all of the tumor reactivity. You can see this is for five different tumors that that activity is contained in. And if you look at the populations, it turns out that 41BB is the smallest and ergo the most select population, that TIM3 and LAG3 tend to be a little more generous in their coverage of, of these populations, and PD-1 is a little more constrained. So if you wanted the most enriched population, you'd use 41BB or PD-1. And so that is the last thing I'm going to show you, which is one of these approaches that we want to try. This is the way we do things now. We take a tumor, we dice it up, we set it up in initial cultures, we do this cumbersome assay then, we have to wait two to four weeks before you can do it. Before this thing gets out of control, you're going to pick three or four of these subcultures and then put them into, you do the assay, cumbersome assay, you pick three or four cultures and then put them into a rapid expansion with anti-CD3 and IL-2. That happens in two weeks automatically in 95% of patients. So from here on in, it's automatable, it's quick, it's consistent. But this whole process takes five weeks, and you got to do this thing in the middle that most people can't do, or you don't have autologous tumor to do it with. So the alternate is to take a single cell suspension, put it through a clinical sorter, sorting for 41BB or PD-1, and put it right into this vessel and infuse those cells. And you have some confidence this will contain virtually all of the cells with autologous tumor reactivity. And so this is a protocol that we now have in final review, and we have a sorter, and we're trying to figure out where to put the cells and where to get them back out. And this will take about all day to get enough cells, 10 to the, 5 times 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, to put into this. But you skip all of this. You save yourself two to four weeks. You save yourself a technician and an assay, and hopefully you'll get cells of equal quality. And then it can also be uh, studied uh, more rigorously. So that's the last uh, slide I'm going to show you, but it shows you what are the targets of TILS. Well, hopefully, hopefully we now know what they are, and even more hopefully, we may not need to know what they are. And these are the people involved, Steve Rosenberg, all the various lab people, and thank you.